Welcome back everybody. Got a new video here. A couple of topics that were suggested. Uh, I'll probably call this uh, breeding bulldog to bulldog. And uh, it's kind of along the lines of, uh, of uh, do you breed bulldog to bulldog no matter the traits? Or do you breed dogs with similar traits? And of course the the disclaimer, nothing intended for legal purposes. Talking about history. If I sound like I'm talking in the present, I'm not. I don't have dogs anymore. And uh, uh, it's just my way of talking, you know, just to get a point across or make things a little bit clearer. But uh, that's a good question. Do you breed bulldog to bulldog uh, no matter what the traits are or do you breed dogs with similar traits? Uh, you can do either way and following those patterns it would be dependent on the outcome so basically breeding bulldog to bulldog means you know you're breeding titled dogs or proven dogs or superior dogs you know you can do that but along with that uh something i mentioned before if you if you breed dogs with similar traits, you have a better chance of getting of capturing those traits. Along with that, there's another technique where uh, you're breeding dogs uh, where one side has benefits to it, the other side has benefits to it, but they also each side lacks something that the other side has. So. Uh, those are some of the um some of the ways to go about it right and the one thing uh, you know i always kept in mind speaking of the past is the dogs were bred for a particular function so they share because of that function or those functions they share certain traits anyways whether it's athletic ability whether it's style whether it's particular uh you know, uh, things like prey drive or finish or, you know, uh, how they go about doing it. You know, offensive, defensive moves, intelligence, wrestling ability, you know, which again, all this always relates to the present time. If you're using them for, say, hunting hogs or something, you know, you want dogs that perform a certain way against hogs, you know. Some dogs, the way they perform would be detrimental on hogs would be detrimental to for that use right whereas in the past there's uh there's also de detrimental things that a dog can have but the the main thing was their athleticism in doing the function that they were originally bred for with that you get a lot of similarities and breeding bulldog to bulldog, you're breeding, put it this way, you're breeding high performance animals with high performance animals. And then you can pick and choose, you know, which ones you want to use based on the traits that they display. And then after the fact, based on the their ability to reproduce those traits. And again, I just seem to have better percentages. Overall, if I bred dogs that had similar traits, because then you take out the, you take out that option of, you know, it may have these particular traits I want on one side, but they're lacking those particular traits on the other side, so I may not get them, you know, I may not capture those traits, or in a, in a good uh, scenario, outcome, they capture those good traits and then whatever negatives are in there they're depleted or there's less of them so there's all kinds of you know there like i always say too you know and i'm repetitive a lot of times because you know the same topic comes up or you have new members or new people coming in or someone who hasn't heard it before and uh, that's the first time they're hearing it so i'm always going to be repetitive 
because the topics always come up over and over again the same topics and new ones so I try and cover the whole spectrum of everything as much as I can much as my knowledge and experience allows me to you know I don't know everything but uh, believe me everything I do talk about I have experience with it you know and I make that point if I don't have experience with it or if I got it from someone else I'm gonna say that too you know whether it's information or something I saw someone else do so there really isn't a best way you know uh, if you're using that marker to do something it's what has proven to work best for you and in that type of scenario or that type of thought you know it's always best to try both or Try all three ways or all four ways, different ways, just so you have that experience and you know what actually works with your dogs and what doesn't. So it's never, with me, it was never a either or. It was always, you know, I got to try it and see if it works or not. And also, you know, if someone told me, you know, you can't do this, or you can't do that, you know, my question is why? Now they might give me an answer, why? But that answer might just be particular to them. If it's something I want to try or something I want to do or something that doesn't make sense to me that you can't do this or this doesn't work, I'm going to find out. And sometimes you find out that, that they were right. You can't do that. You know, uh, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't remove certain inherent traits that are in an individual. Like if they're born and they're genetically timid. Uh, you can't change that. You can only try and breed it out in future generations. If a dog's destructive, you can't generally change that. But you can breed away from it in future generations. If a dog's a man biter, and that's the way he was, it was born. If it wasn't influenced that way, then. Uh, you can't generally change it, but you can breed away from it, you know, things of that nature. So, yeah, you can breed bulldog to bulldog. And there's benefits to breeding dogs with similar traits. Another part of this that came up was, uh, uh, do you breed scatterbred with different traits? Uh, or... Basically, it's saying scatterbred with different traits will be no good. Some say it doesn't matter. Again, it's it's individual. And sometimes that word scatterbred gets thrown around because they see multiple crosses or they see individuals, dogs, bloodlines, whatever it is that they're not familiar with. So immediately they term it as scatterbred, right? But if you go back a generation or two, you see commonalities or you see breedings that were made uh, where, where they proved to be effective. The, the crosses proved to work. That's why they made those crosses. But as you go along, you know, a, a breeder generally, even if it has different crosses in there and different methods of breeding, uh, within his own family of dogs, the dogs become related to some degree, some closer, some more distant. So we have to be careful using that term scatterbred. If you have a particular way of breeding, and let's say you use a three-way cross or a four-way cross, there's a reason that a breeder does that, right? They're using three major bloodlines or four major bloodlines because they've proven to work or the individuals they're using have been able to to produce you put them together and now you're capturing certain traits where talking about what I said previously where even though it's a three-way or four-way cross they share common traits they share particular things about them that all three or four of those bloodlines have where scatter breeding has no form or function to it. It's just breeding a bunch of dogs together, you know. Now, the one thing about having these multiple crosses together is the gene pool becomes more broad. 
So in that sense, it may be harder for you to capture the traits you want. So when it comes to a multiple cross dog or a scatterbred dog, as it's worded here, if you find one that's a, a, a superior individual and one that has the ability to produce good dogs, you can key on that particular dog, making your breedings line bred on that particular dog. And that's where it tightens up. That's where there's more closer breedings to it. Even if you breed a three-way cross dog to another outcross dog, the quickest way to tighten up on that would be breed that, that male to one of his daughters from that fourth cross that you put in there. Or continue with your breeding and then you throw that male in there to one of the grandchildren. You use that male to one of his nieces in the next couple of generations. Which would tighten up on that individual even though his gene pool is more broad. You're capturing that particular individual's traits. And as you go along you're tightening up. Or you're concentrating on that particular individual, even though he's outcrossed. Three way, four way, whatever it is. So you have, and you place them on both sides of the pedigrees so that through the genetics, you're concentrating on that individual. The benefits of, of using an individual like that, if you line breed them in that fashion, whether it's tight or loose, is you start out with an individual that is a superior athlete. Very athletic. A lot of good traits in him. He's bred a particular way. And he also has the ability to reproduce a lot of his good traits. So when you tighten up like that as you move forward line breeding, you're concentrating on those good traits, which kind of negates him being a three or four way cross. Because that particular individual himself has a lot of positive things about him plus he's able to produce so in a perfect world not only is he able to produce but his offspring and his progeny are able to produce him as well or her as well and I'll use Dirty Mary as an example she was a grand champion Hank bred to Red Baby it's basically a dibo, heavy dibo on the top. Line bred, if you want to put it that way. Bred to Red Baby, you know, line bred Grand Champion Hank. Bred to Red Baby, which is basically Bolio Klaus. So you have at least three bloodlines there, particular bloodlines there. Even though if you go behind there, there's some commonality behind it. With the dibo and Hank and the dibo in Bolio. Dibo in Bolio through Black Widow. And then you have the Klaus blood, which in this particular place is a uh, particular um, breeding. Uh, a lot of it was Old Family Red Nose, if you want to put it that way. Or Klaus himself. Right? So in that respect, that OFRN works with the Dibo stuff. That, that's two ways you could look at it. There's commonality with the Dibo blood. With the Bolio and the and the Hank. And uh, those crosses. with the, the cross with the Klaus. Has proven to work with several different bloodlines. Because a lot of the dogs. Regardless of how they're bred. Have OFRN in their background. And when you stick the Klaus in there, it's kind of like bringing that OFRN stuff to the front back that way. So you have Dirty Mary, basically a three-way cross. And what Boyles did, because she was a good athlete and because she was game. And because she had the ability to produce, he concentrated on her in future breedings. So through most of Boyles' breedings, you have Dirty Mary throughout on both sides of the pedigrees. You have half-brother, half-sister, cousins being bred, uh, uncle to niece, and aunt to nephew, and all that. So 
it, they're permeated with dirty mary throughout those pedigrees same thing was done with honey bunch where you have honey bunch bred to otis bred to rascal bred to finley's bow right and if you concentrate in the same patterns like what was done with dirty mary or any other female right the predominant factor in the, in your breedings are going to be honey bunch that's kind of how i did mine they're called jeep dogs and they were heavy jeep but because my dogs had rascal jr in their background and i threw some more rascal jr in there rascal jr being off a of rascal and honey bunch now it's more concentrated on honey bunch rather than jeep which is you know uh because she was a great athlete and a producer that's that's the way i wanted to go and like i said they did the same thing with black widow you know you have Dibo black widow kern's lucky black widow spike black widow zeke black widow right concentrating on black widow so you know uh, the same thing was done with boomerang you know and arts missy you see boomerang concentrated on boomerang he's on both sides of a lot of pedigrees doesn't have to be inbred more line bred and then uh you see arts missy uh the same way that's what made her a, a great producer you know you have arts missy uh bred to different males and people continuing on uh with her blood whether it was through boomerang whether it was through uh i mean uh whether it was through stompanato or was it was through uh uh the fox stuff you know fox being a litter mate to to arts missy and boomerang you know and up north they bred fox to the uptown boys champion snubby stuff you know uh you have boomerang in the south being crossed with the midnight cowboy shibo stuff and and the Kaler blood, Jake Kohler blood, or Kaler, you know. And you have the Arts Missy with the Stompanato. And uh, you see some commonality with that. Arts Missy being off of, uh, down from Miss Spike. You have that, uh, um, you know, Tudor Spike in there. Which, you know, when you cross Bolio with Boomerang or Bolio with Arts Missy, you have... <laughs> Tudor Spike, and you also have Tudor Spike Black Widow stuff in there. So, um, uh, when people say, you know, it doesn't matter, or, uh, you know, or it's, it won't work, it'll be no, this here, it's saying, you know, it'll be no good, or some say it doesn't matter. When they say it doesn't matter, to me, that means, you know, you can make it work if you're using the right individuals and if they're able to pass on their traits. When they say it'll be no good, it's because those standards weren't followed, you know. They're just putting stuff together with no patterns, no form, no function to back it up. And be basically just breeding on paper. And that's why the function... And the breeder involved and what they did with their dogs uh, makes all the difference in the world, right? Because a lot of pedigrees, they look good. Most of them look good. You can't hard, hardly look at a pit bull pedigree and say, well, that's crap just looking at the pedigree. But if it is crap, it's, it's due not to, not due to, how the pedigree is put together, but the individuals in it. If they didn't do anything with them, you know. And again, like in today's time, you know, I speak on health and I speak on durability and work ethic and thick skin and, you know, healthy individuals with good internal organs and, uh, you know, proper nutrition and epigenetics and upkeep you know how they're raised and what environment they're in and are you working their mind along with their body you know that's that's where that comes into play in today's world as far as function you know again i become repetitive 
you know, or uh, use them for hunting, use them for legal sports. Teach them some obedience. That helps keep their mind sharp. Give them something to do, whether chasing a ball or going swimming or running a treadmill, going fishing, take them to the mountains, take them swimming, you know, wherever you go. It, 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 part of the, of the quality of breed comes with them doing something and working their mind as well as their body, keeping them interested in something. Keeping things like prey drive in them and work ethic in their mind. Because once you stop that, that's where the quality of the individual and the quality of the breed itself goes down. So there's all these breeding methods. And there's always all these different ways to go about it. And all of it in the right perspective can work. At the same time, it can all go south if you don't have standards to keep up with what you're trying to do with your individual dogs and your family of dogs as a whole so you know it's just something to keep in mind they're good questions and uh you know the the thing with breeding is you're trying to capture these traits you're trying to be able to choose individuals and prove that they can produce those traits and once you do, the, you figure that out, you can keep those traits going almost forever and ever. The good thing, like I mentioned earlier about the breed itself, is a lot of these traits are common within the dogs anyways, right? Almost as common as a dog has four legs, you know? Almost as common as uh, the dogs are built for running, you know? They're built for being on their feet. For hours at a time sometimes. And they're built for moving around. They're built for running and jumping and skipping. And you know. You catch my drift. Right. There's good things about them. They're built a certain way. That's why they're good for hunting. You know. They have certain instincts. They have good eyesight. They have a good nose about them. You know. Their structure allows them to perform all these different types of tasks. Just because of the breeding that's behind them, the way they're built, and the individual kept these certain uh, structures, you know, and and you see it in the dogs, you know, you have a strong, powerful dog, he's built strong and powerful. You have a fast, action type of individual, he's built for speed and action. You have an intelligent individual whose mind is focused on the task at hand and he understands what he has to do and how to finish the task or complete it or perform it. That's part of their breeding too. So we have to be careful when we use uh, words like scatterbred. And like I said, it usually comes because somebody will look at a pedigree and they don't understand it. They're not familiar with it. But if you familiarize yourself with all these breedings and all these uh, uh, different bloodlines and the breeders themselves, then that'll, when you get to the end and you understand all this, that'll tell you whether it's scatterbred or not. Because it very well could be scatterbred if it's three or four or five or six different outcrosses. Because the traits weren't concentrated on. The traits weren't carried over. The individual breeder it's himself might not even know what traits are. That's why they just put them together and we'll see what happens, you know. That's not a good recipe for breeding. For someone else, they're, they're consciously putting these different bloodlines together or families of dogs together because they know what has worked in the past. They know what clicks real good with each other. And they know that there's commonality behind them, right? If you talk about a Dybo dog like Hank, right? And you're not familiar with his sire and dam and grandparent and like that, you're not going to know what it is. But then you go back far enough and you see, well, he's related to Tombstone. He's related to Maloney's, Day, uh, you know, Davis. 
He's related to Fontenot's booger in some form or fashion. He's related to Tonka in some form or fashion, you know. And uh, that, that's where your knowledge and experience and familiarity with the breeds, with the breeds, bloodlines and families of dogs and the breeders themselves come into play. And it's something, here's something I mentioned uh, in another platform is, you know, we always talk about Carver and he said, you know, he'll give you the cake, but not the recipe, right? And, you know, I've even said because of that, you know, just the statement, not, not this is nothing against Carver, right? That you don't need a recipe. You don't need someone's recipe if you know how to breed dogs, right? You make your own recipe. You figure it out. The recipe, and, and this came from the fact that there's so many fake peds and so many unknowns and this and that. Well, none of that ever stopped anybody from breeding good dogs. But within that statement, you know, with a lot of these breeders, you got to kind of learn to read between the lines. Or you have to have an understanding on what are they really talking about. Are they throwing you off? Are they just feeding you some stuff to you know uh you know kind of like let's see if this guy can figure out what i'm saying or does he understand what i'm talking about there's all kinds of different reasons why breeders or whoever it is talk the way they do so sometimes they're giving you the information it's right in front of you but you're not paying attention or you're not understanding what they're saying so regardless of whether some of Carver's pedigrees are fake or false or changed or whatever it is. Or regardless of some of that stuff that he said, you know, the pedigrees are exactly what he said they are. The one thing that always stuck in my head was Carver, like, and he say, stated this himself, that's where it's coming from, that he preferred loose line breeding. That's what he liked. That's the way he liked to breed. Just like I mentioned with Boyle, he liked half-brother, half-sister breeding. So Carver preferred loose line breeding. So however you look at his pedigrees, you don't have to wonder, is this real or that real? And, and, and at this point, it don't matter anyways what the pedigree says, or what, whether he changed something or faked something or didn't tell you or whatever. His method was loose line breeding for the most part. So that's how I would look at his pedigrees. All his dogs are related in some form or fashion. They're not tight bred. Even though a pedigree might say that. And yeah, that pedigree with that one individual might be tight bred. But over a period of time and over a span of generations, he didn't like inbred dogs. He didn't inbreed them. So, if you follow Carver and you understand certain males and females were his favorites and probably because they produce, proved to be able to produce, that, you know, he did take advantage of Ironhead's breeding production. He did like Black Widow. He did like Arts Missy. He did like Cracker. Right, with certain of those individuals I just named, and probably a few other ones, Zeke, maybe you know. That's where he was concentrating his his breedings on. So it doesn't matter really what they were, or what the real story is to me, anyways. I'm speaking for myself, right? If those individuals are in the pedigree. Or even if they're in the pedigree and it doesn't show that they're in the pedigree, they're probably in there. Because he knew enough to know which ones to use. And a lot of it was Ed Crenshaw blood. Or dogs that he shared with Earl Hunter. Or dogs he got from Jake Kohler. Or dogs he got he shared with Ray Long, right? There's commonality in all 
those greedy. And a lot of it is they had Crenshaw stuff. And later on, he, he liked the Bully Son stuff or the Eli stuff. So he included that. Those are in his pedigrees too, whether it's Stompanato or, or Arts Missy or whether it's, uh, you know, Stomper or, or you know, the uh, Bully Son, Arts Missy, Litter, whatever. He's putting that stuff together. He's putting the Eli, basically, with the Ed Crenshaw stuff, basically. And before that, he was involved with the with the Kobe Leitner dogs, you know. So even that pattern is repeated in some of the breedings because that's what Ed Crenshaw had predominantly was Kobe Leitner stuff, right? And I'm not saying uh, Carver added the Lapaces or Lapaces bullet in there. But uh, Bullet had uh, some Kobe Leitner in him, and he's related to uh, Daibo, you know, a descendant, at least of, of Trehan's rascal, you know. So you see these patterns being repeated over and over again. So I looked at it kind of like, you know, this particular breeder like these dogs for a particular reason or reasons whether it's jeep with the honey bunch stuff whether it's tudor and carver and all these other guys with the black widow stuff and zeke and daibo and spike and all that or whether it's uh you know uh, ray long earl hunter and you know uh, carver also you know likes the ed crenshaw stuff at some point they're going to put this stuff all together so it's based on those family of dogs. It's based on uh, those bloodlines. And uh, for me, as long as it's coming down from that, it's going to work and I'll make it work. You know, That's the same with Finley's Bow and Honey Bunch. You have uh, a lot of Kobe in there, actually. You know, Bow's heavy Kobe. Honey Bunch bottom side through Amber. Ed Crenshaw stuff, there's Kobe in there. So you see commonalities like that. When you see the Red Boy Jocko stuff, you know, regardless of all the controversy about Red Boy, he was a producer. Most people would admit he, he at least had Kobe behind him, whether it's Tip or whatever they say and all that crap that I don't care about. But I'll talk about it because it's part of the breed. So I'm not saying, you know, anybody's wrong for thinking that way or doing whatever they do. But you see it, you know, uh, uh, the Red Boy Cross with the Jocko, you know, and then you have the Jocko with the heavy Daibo stuff with some Mayfield, and then you have Lightning too, and all that stuff. You see the same cross, Kobe Daibo, old rugged cross, you know. And then, you know, you can get into whatever, May Day with the, with the Red Boy Jocko, Tombstone, Bolio. You see some commonality back there, go far enough. But they they have proven to work you know and there's even some bolio corvino uh eli behind mayday some old stuff and corvino was used by you know a lot of these people i talk about you know heinzo used this stuff tudor used this stuff it's in some of the carver dogs it's in, you know, a lot of the dogs come from Northeast, you know, it's just even, you know, um, um, the Divines had it, you know, and all them guys from the Chicago area, Buffalo Soldier, and, you know, there's a little bit of Corvino here and there and everybody. These guys traded dogs back and forth. So a lot of these guys got their stuff from Corvino, you know, because it was known to have the real game, you know, and smart. Uh, so you see the same patterns being done over and over again. And that's why I kind of tell people, you know, don't be too concerned about what happened in the past. It doesn't matter. What hap what matters most is what's in front of you today, right? But you can read between the lines or you can get the information from these people because they are telling you. It's just you got to, you know, pay attention to what they're actually saying or if it's something you read from them. Uh, you can pick up, pick it up that way, you know. 
For example, I'll give you two quick examples. Carver criticized the Ed Crenshaw dogs at a convention that he saw once. He wrote about it, you know. Uh, I think one of the dogs quit, and uh, and he said, well, you know, class will tell and crap will smell, you know. That, that's what he wrote. It's in Pete Sparks magazine. And then Pete Sparks himself it was a Kobe dog. I forget if it was Teal or one of them. He wrote something similar. The dog quit and he goes, well, there's that old Kobe blood quitting. Kind of that along those lines, right? But if you follow them, Carver used Ed Crenshaw dogs. Why would he do that? Why would he criticize them and do that? A lot of the Sparks dogs were heavy Kobe dogs. So why would they say that? Is it to throw you off? Is it that particular moment that this happened, the dog quit, so they criticized it? Is it they, they're keeping you from what they're trying to do? Or they don't want you to go in that direction? You know, because even though Sparks criticized the Kobe dog and Carver criticized the Crenshaw dog, the Ed Crenshaw dog, they both had that blood heavy in their family of dogs. So don't always believe, uh, you know, on its face, what these guys are saying to you is actually how they really feel. So, you know, when you're listening to somebody talk, pay attention. When you're looking at pedigrees, pay attention. See what they really, uh, you know, what they were really doing. I mean, does it matter if a certain dog is off a of pistol or pistol junior? It could matter. But they're close enough for where maybe it don't matter. Doesn't matter if it's pistol, pistol junior, iron head, cracker, you know, Zeke, whatever it is. And they did the same thing in Mexico. They're the same crosses, same breeding, same line breeding, this and that. Why? Because it worked. If nothing else, it's the same bloodlines from the same breeders. They may be different dogs, but those dogs are related in some way. Sometimes pretty close. Sometimes they're littermates to the famous dogs or they're offspring from those famous dogs that went to Mexico. And they just did the same thing that was done up here. And vice versa. The guys up here did the same thing what they did in Mexico. So that's a little bit, again, on this topic. I'm not sure what I'm going to call it. Maybe I'll call it uh, Breed Bulldog to Bulldog question mark. But once again, thanks for your support. Thanks for subscribing. And if you have any questions, put it in the comment section. We'll have a little conversation. Thanks again.